everybody, and welcome back to the Taoist Arts Organization International Podcast. This is our Dowie Talks Expert Series. My guest today is Dr. Louis Kamiathi. Dr. Kamiathi is an independent scholar educator and globally recognized authority on Taoism, Taoist practice, and translation. He's the author of numerous works, including The Taoist Tradition and a Primer for Translating Taoist Literature. Uh, along with Kate Townsend, he is the co-founder and co-director of the Dallas Foundation, which is a Dallas inter intentional community and contemplative collective dedicated to preserving authentic Dallas practices, source texts, and other cultural materials. Lewis, thank you for joining me today. I appreciate it. Thanks for the opportunity to be here. I wanted to just kind of share with you at the outset in our, our audience, too, the reason why I wanted to talk to you today or how I, how I came in contact with your writings and so on. Um, I'm a student of Master Zhou Zhuan Yun, um, who I think you know. Yeah. And um, a few years ago, I was staying at his house in New Hampshire, uh, training with him. And uh, he has a library there. And there's a lot of books in his library. And some of them are his and some of them are given to him by students and other visitors. And uh, when I wasn't practicing, I, I would be reading and trying to relax. And um, Shifu sometimes, uh, you know, he would see what book I was reading and maybe grunt or roll his eyes right. <laughs> not, or not say anything and then uh one day i was reading i think it was the Dallas tradition it might have been the horse taming pictures but it was one of those one of those two books and he walked by and he said that's a good book and i kind of looked at him to make sure he wasn't being sarcastic and i said it's it <laughs> and he said yeah it's a very good book he said lewis's translations are very accurate um he said that because he doesn't try to put his own personal spin on things he said he, he translates what it actually says and um you know it's rare for him to 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 say things like that. So I, I knew I was on the right track there. So that's that's part of the reason why I wanted to yeah, talk. That's good to hear. Thanks. Yeah. Sure. <clears throat> so here we are, and it's 2024. And for some reason, there's still a debate going on about what Taoism is and isn't. And you talk about this in uh, pretty extensively in your book, The Taoist Tradition, which I recommend to people, um, especially if they're first starting out uh, learning about Taoism. Um. <clears throat> It's, it's a big subject. And as you say in the book, you know, depending on what your theoretical approach is, lots of different things could be defined as Taoism. But I thought it might be simpler at the outset to talk about you stated in the book that one approach that you felt was wholly inaccurate and untenable was this idea that there are two Taoisms, a philosophical Taoism and a religious Taoism. And you termed that the Legian view or the Victorian view. Could you explain why this is an inaccurate um, approach to understanding Taoism, uh, what it is, and why it's still the pervasive uh, view of a lot. Yeah, I mean, so the so you know, part of I'll just say a couple things to contextualize the Taoist tradition because it was published in 2013. You know, so one one kind of subtext or context of the Taoist tradition was really to make an argument about a kind of continuity of tradition and what I refer to as more of a lineal view of Taoism and, you know, more recently we're kind of referring to it as the Center for Taoist Studies approach because that's what we're developing now and kind of broadening out that that kind of scholarly uh, community. But um, the reason I'm, I'm qualifying that is there are many types of Taoism. There's just no such thing as philosophical Taoism or religious Taoism. That's not where the diversity lies. The diversity lies in the different historical periods and the different movements. So I do think um, Kate and I were talking about this um, more recently, and she said, well, you know, maybe now you could kind of do a revised version of the book and call it Taoist Traditions and talk about the diversity. And so what I'm trying to say, I think, to your audience is that, you know, at the time, I was really trying to show people the connections throughout the tradition and kind of de-emphasizing the diversity part in the sense of saying, well, let's look more at the kind of unitive dimensions of the tradition. So yeah, that kind of what I refer to as the Legian or I mean, Victorian works, I also talk about it as the bifurcated, meaning kind of like splitting Taoism into two, is really coming out of the history of colonialism, missionization and Orientalism, um, and obviously in relationship to China. And part of it is a kind of Protestant Christian construction of Taoism that's trying to look for some kind of pure Taoism, quote unquote, that they construct as philosophical Taoism because they actually don't want it to be religious. Right. So this is like an ongoing debate. And unfortunately, it's starting to show up again with people, I think, with some flawed arguments about how it's actually viable. Well, it's not viable because there's no indigenous um, distinction. 
of that. You know, sometimes people will say, well, Dao Jia and Dao Jia. Contextually, that's not what those terms meant. And in fact, Dao Jia, the family of the Dao that oftentimes gets used as, oh, this is in an in indigenous context, what approximates philosophy. But there's no idea of philosophy there. So, and in fact, what it really is talking about is the family of the Dao. So to kind of give your audience just a kind of brief summation, um, James Legg, and it's kind of surprising, but his works are still in print. And I think they could be in print as historical artifacts or kind of you know, cultural materials, but they're still in print and people are reading them as though they're accurate kind of renderings of these materials. So the reason I kind of label him as the kind of principal advocate of this is because of how influential he was. He wasn't the only one talking this way or constructing Taoism in this way. But, and this is, I think, the key point for me, is there's a question of what do we mean by philosophy? So Taoism clearly is not philosophy in a conventional Western sense, even though that's how people tend to engage engage it. Is it religion? So I think yes, but then we have all these questions about, well, what do we mean by categorizing something as religion or religious? And the key point here, and this is really the, the kind of one of the revisionist frameworks that's in the Taoist tradition book and now in most of my work is thinking about the earliest form of Taoism as classical Taoism and setting aside whether or not it's philosophical and whether or not it's religious at the beginning and just actually engaging it and then seeing what its kind of dominant qualities are or characteristics are. And this, there's a fuller treatment of this in, the, in my new Tao Te Ching book where I try to show people all the evidence for this kind of self-conscious Taoist community that I think is more accurately labeled as religious. And I know that will probably cause certain people to have reservations or, um, yeah, or, or difficulty because of the received frameworks. But the reason I say that is when we really look at the Taoist tradition, and that's classical Taoism, what we're talking about is a substitute or um, an alternative to the philosophical Taoism construct, is that it's religious in the sense of it, the tradition itself thinks of itself in terms of the Tao, in terms of the sacred or ultimate reality um, that we're part of. And so when you start to really analyze it, it looks much more religious than it does philosophical. But I've said this to a number of kind of you know, um, historians of Chinese intellectual uh, traditions is I'm, not, I'm, I'm fine if we just wanna talk about Taoism, that's fine. You know? And then we can get into this question of, well, what are the dominant characteristics of Taoism? But what happens is, is it's like, denying that Taoism as a religion is a way to avoid some of these questions, including the central uh, dimension of theology in Taoism. And when I say theology, I would say Taoology, but then no one would know what I'm talking about. So when I say theology, I mean discourse on the sacred, and so we're talking about the Tao. So is that somewhat clear? Yes, it is. Yeah. And, you know, when I think about people like Leg, you know, obviously he found something that he thought was of value in, in this, this worldview, Taoist worldview, but um, perhaps not to him and definitely not to his audience at the time, it wouldn't have been acceptable for him to say, you know, this is a valuable religion. Right. Separate the, re the religious aspect from the, from the philo philosophical aspect, so to speak. Yeah. And there's, there's a bunch of historical influences, I think kind of cultural forces at work for that. So the kind of key thing here is, you know, I recognize James, James Lake's historical moment. So I'm not vilifying James Lake. James Legg was doing important work at his time, but they're dated, they're inaccurate. And the really bizarre thing is, and again, it's not just James Legg, it's this kind of whole kind of um, intellectual milieu, academic milieu that he's participating in coming out of continues. Yeah. And so it's odd, right, that this remains the dominant view and including then this like um, constant uh, like retranslation, quote unquote, but really just the, the kind of the, the publication of this almost the same translation of the Tao Te Ching through that framework of philosophical Taoism, instead of re-engaging these texts and saying, what are these texts really about? What are they describing? What are they emphasizing? That makes you go, oh, it's a lot more theological, as I said, in the sense of about something that's ultimately real soteriological in the sense of it's really about realizing the Tao and realizing the Tao by doing a certain kind of practice, apophatic and quietistic meditation, and these kinds of things. And then it just destabilizes 
this whole kind of undertaking in the modern world. And that's what's odd, right? Is really that in the modern world, we're still largely encountering this colonialist, missionary, and orientalist construction of Taoism that doesn't have anything really, any approximation of both what it actually was in its context. But this is one of the key points too, and this is in the Taoist tradition, kind of in the early stages of it, is a decolonial or post-colonial perspective. And that may be unfamiliar to some of your listeners, but what that means is how have Taoists understood their and our tradition? And also not through philosophical and religious Taoism. Even if you can say, well, there's some modern Taoists that think about this, it's like that's called internalized colonialism. That's mm -hmm. what that is. Historically, Taoists did not think about Taoism through this, this bifurcated view, whether in indigenous terms you talk about so called Tao Jia and so called Tao Jiao, or in a Western context, so called philosophical Taoism, so called religious Taoism. You know, so what I would say is just to encourage your listeners to investigate, investigate this on their own. You know, and look into this question of what do we mean by philosophy? What do we mean by religion? Why do we categorize it this way? What do the texts support? How is the tradition kind of understood itself and thought about these kinds of materials and so on? So there are many kinds of what I oftentimes refer to as contemplative inquiries. So if people are Taoists or Taoist sympathizers. There's a set of contemplative inquiries you can go through on your own to really investigate this. And, you know, don't take my word for it. So, as I said, it's really in the Tao Te Ching book where I take on the challenge of saying, OK, I know people are skeptical of this. I will give you a systematic argument based on evidence of why I'm saying what I'm saying. That makes sense. And, you know, I think that there might be a perception, you know, Leg wanted to, to separate the, the, you know, he wanted to pr pr uh, promote this or show this as a philosophy and not a religion so that it would be more palatable to the to his audience. And I think, do you, do you necessarily think that there's, a, that, you know, if a person is secular, let's just say that secular, not, not of another religion, but just secular or agnostic, um, there, there's nothing necessarily about the approach you're talking about that excludes them from believing in this material. No, I don't think there's anything that excludes them. Although I do think this is a whole nother conversation about if people say, if people say they're atheists, what do they really mean? Because it's possible to have what I refer to as something like a pan and Hennick theology that is nature as a whole as the sacred and be an atheist, quote unquote, because it's a denial of theism. So I think there's also a way to be a Taoist and be non-theistic. So this isn't about theism. The, uh, theism is a separate subject. There's a very particular, and I, it's in the Taoist tradition book, but I talk about it all the time, is there's a very particular kind of foundational, classical and foundational Taoist theology that's not theistic. Doesn't mean theism isn't included, but it, that's this kind of secondary concern. So absolutely it includes people. I think the thing we have to say though, is Taoist practice is inherently theological. Right. So you can do practices in a more kind of secular or um, I think non committed, quote unquote, way, but that the practices themselves are oriented towards something larger than ourselves. So, again, I think we can set aside the theism question and say something simply like, do you believe there's something more than the merely human? I think most people do. So, of course, there's a whole set of influences on um, modern atheism, and again, that's a subject for another time. I mean, I think probably some of your listeners know I have a PhD in religious studies, so I've thought about these issues both in terms of Taoism, but also the larger culture. But, you know, I think in, from a Taoist perspective, there's always something more. And we don't have to know what it is. We don't have to define what it is, right? We don't even, and this is in Taoism, right? The Tao Te Ching says, compelled to name it, we call it Tao. And this is also in the anonymous 8th century, really important text, anonymous 8th century uh, Qing Jing Jing, scripture on clarity and stillness. So Taoists themselves and ourselves will say, we just use Tao as a placeholder for something larger than the merely human. And we define it as mysterious. So that actually can fit into some of these other views. The challenge, I think, with, with at least some forms of new atheism is it's hyper rationalistic and rationalism won't get you there 
intellectualism won't get you there from a traditional Taoist perspective, right? Intellect and reason is inherently limited. It's not the ultimate human faculty. So this is one of the radical challenges of Taoism, of, of the way that it understands the human condition, the way that it understands consciousness, the way that it understands being. And I think all of that actually has a lot to offer anyone that you don't have to be a Taoist. You can also say, I don't really care about something larger than myself, but the kinds of insights that Taoism offers, I think have a very large applicable, kind of, a, a very large application. I agree. It's very practical. Uh, what do you think the reason is for the um, pervasiveness of this attitude of the, the bifurcated tradition where, you know, people even to this day, after all of these decades are still insisting that there are two, two different things going on. Well, I think one is it's, it's like thoroughly entrenched in Western culture. So it's very difficult to kind of extract yourself from it and people are still perpetuating it. So it's a kind of hive mind in a certain way. You know, it's like consensus mind and consensus reality, although, and this is also in the book, not in mainstream, you know, kind of sinological engagements with Taoism. There's a whole nother problematic construction there. But I think the other thing, and I've said this a lot more recently, is because it gives people what they want. You know, they don't want to have to confront the kind of radical challenge of Taoism on its own terms a lot of the time. Um, also, a lot of people are coming out of things like religious abuse right. or religious trauma or like, oh, my God, like institutional corruption of religion. And, you know, to be honest, Taoism hasn't avoided that either. I mean, as far as we know, it's avoided some of the extreme things that we've seen in the modern world, all of this kind of religious scandal and kind of, you know, sexual abuse and all these kinds of things. But it hasn't avoided intellectual intellectual. <laughs> that's funny. I was, I was about to say intellectual corruption. Maybe that's true too. Institutional corruption. Um, and so that kind of element of, and I'm, I'm sympathetic to it. You know, there's a certain part of me that's kind of anti-institutionalism, definitely anti-authoritarianism. And there are some parts of Taoism, including in the modern world, that start to move more in the direction of something that's authoritarian and that people conflate that, right? So people yeah. conflate religious institution with religious corruption, or they conflate tradition with institution. And I've written about this explicitly and more of it's in the Tao Te Ching book. And I'm not saying all of this to kind of like promote the Tao Te Ching book. I'm saying if people are really interested, I'm trying to go through it systematically so that people can say, oh, okay, now I understand why you're saying this. I agree with them or I don't agree with them, but that's okay. Now I can think through it in a more critical, and sophisticated way. But in terms of this, it's you come out of that and you're looking for something that doesn't have that. And so then it's like, and then one of my favorite bumper stickers after who would Jesus bomb is um, that was Zen, this is Tao. Yeah. You know? So I'm intentionally mispronouncing it because I think it should be mispronounced here. Um, but it's like that, right? Which is the Westerners were looking to Zen as this alternative, then Zen Buddhists showed up like actual Zen Buddhists, especially Japanese Zen Buddhists showed up in the 60s and 70s. And they were like, what are you doing to our tradition? And it's yeah. like, yeah, that's not Zen. This is like a Western construction of Zen. So then there's a recalibration of Zen and you get things like American Zen that is responding to that and not just following like rigidly what other kind of, you know, non-Western quote unquote, kind of uh, articulations of it are. But in the case of Taoism, we haven't gotten there yet. So it's like everybody shifted their attention to, oh, Taoism is the thing I can be part of without being religious, or Taoism is the thing I can be part of because it doesn't have an institution. And people are oftentimes surprised, you know, when I present on Taoism as a tradition, certain kinds of things like the external three treasures of the Tao, the scriptures and the teachers. And so it's like, okay, well, what are the scriptures then? Are there sacred texts in Taoism? Absolutely. What are they? What text should we, we be reading? But then also in terms of what we're talking about, this kind of understanding of the sure, the teachers could be anyone, right? It could be community elders and so on, senior teachers. But traditionally, it's kind of been understood largely as ordained Taoist priests and monastics. And people go like, what? Taoism has priests and monastics? 
Yes. <laughs> you know? So again, it's partly, I think, the way that Dow's and Blend constructed. And then unfortunately, I think intentional misrepresentations, especially in popular literature, but also non-specialist scholarly literature. Like there's a couple of people now that are in Chinese philosophy that are arguing for philosophical Taoism, and there's just absolutely no evidence or grounds for this kind of viewpoint. It's just clinging to an outdated understanding of what it is. So that kind of leads me nicely to my my next question. You know, let's say that we have someone who's you know come to this point where they're interested in um, you know what you call like ways to affiliation, different ways mm -hmm. to affiliation. One of my concerns right now is that you know as I think more and more people are becoming interested in Taoism, but you know you and I are roughly the same age, and you know we remember in the 1990s when there was this sort of like trendy explosion of Tibetan Buddhism, you know. Right. And, 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 you know, people were genuinely interested in it for probably the right reasons, but then this sort of like uh, industry sprouted up around it. Yeah. And it was very difficult to tell, you know, who is a legitimate teacher, who is someone who is just, you know, putting on some, you know, costume and, and, and you know, like spouting off whatever, you know, yes. so what would you be your advice to a person who is like, you know, really wanted to begin, uh, becoming affiliated in some way with a Taoist community or Taoist tradition? Um, it's difficult. I struggle with this a lot. It's difficult to witness what's going on right now, yeah. you know? So I think it's, you know, there are a lot of layers to it. So I'll just kind of speak more personally on, uh, as a first response, which is, yeah, I mean, I think, as you said, I mean, there's a historical way of engaging um, the Western kind of a, not to repeat myself, the Western engagement with Taoism, which it was largely a set of like, I think popular fictions and constructions, right? And then it's like started a shift. And so now people know more about Taoism. So there's all this rhetoric of lineage. There's all this rhetoric of tradition. And there's like, let me perform Taoism to you in real time by wearing certain things or using certain kinds of languaging. So this is the problem, you know, the things that we might think of, or I think of, I, I should speak personally, that I think of as part of the tradition have also been appropriated into the popular, like kind of presentation of Taoism. So unfortunately, and I know this from people coming to me and talking to, you know, situations of abuse and so on, there's a number of people I think who are playing Taoists. Um, and when you investigate what they're doing, and I don't have the inclination to do that, that was, I mean, I, I kind of joke now, it's like I'm out of the rectification business, but there's a kind of um, aspect that's very disturbing to me, you know, and, and disappointing, you know, and depressing to see it because that's not what it is, but also that's not what it should be. Um, and so there's a, a so I'll, I'll kind of finish that part of the, the, the response with this, you know, in Taoism, there's this kind of strong emphasis on what's called Jantu, true earth, you know, and Jantu on the first level means honesty. So we're like honest with ourselves about our practice. We're honest with what we're doing. And then the deeper part of Jantu is stillness, right? And so that's kind of complicated because you have to be actually rooted in stillness practice for that to resonate. But the first part shouldn't be problematic, like just be honest, you know, and be honest, like with what what your training is, be honest with what you actually have the ability to teach, be honest with the things that you don't know. You know, this is simple, but it's not simple in the modern world. So it's a kind of question of how do we cultivate virtue and how do we cultivate integrity? So I think that's the first thing. I mean, I think the second thing from my perspective is unfortunately you really have to have some kind of self-educate, self-education. You have to have critical discernment. So this gets again, somewhat complicated in Taoism because there's a part of Taoism that is kind of critiquing ordinary mind and critiquing judgmental mind and critiquing the kind of tendency of humans to overanalyze things. But if you don't, and I'm speaking from direct experience, observing multiple things, people just accept what's being taught to them. And even things that are being taught as though they're tradition based, if you know the tradition and you know the history, it's not. So, right. So then you have all these kinds of issues. So one, one thing that I oftentimes, um, uh, one aspect of the tradition that I oftentimes emphasize to people that really resonates with me and I, you know, use it in my own work, especially thinking about translation is uh, Tao Te Ching chapter 16, 
that the principal is way done, right? Returning to the root or returning to the roots. And then of course, in that chapter, this is one of the chapters that I identify as the seven core contemplative chapters of the Tao Te Ching. It is defined as stillness. But if we take it out, like you were asking about people who have this general, more general interest in Taoism, if we take it out and we say, go back to the roots, what are the roots of the tradition? So that includes what's the source of what's being taught. So if people are saying this is coming from this text, it's like, okay, can I see that text? And I've done this with a number of people um, where it's like, this person is teaching this uh, as this. It's like, okay, I'd like to see it. And then the text never appears. Right? It's like, right, because it's not actually coming from a text. And it's definitely not coming from a text 1500 years ago. <laughs> but how do you know that? So I think one part is, you know, really uh, self-education, a certain kind of critical discernment. And then ideally, and this is not easy, but finding a trustworthy teacher, you know, but it's just what you said. Well, that's like, how do you know if they're trustworthy? Yeah, so that, that part's challenging. And I don't know if that's helpful or not, but I, I, I find it difficult to, I mean, I think there's a lot going on that's a kind of performance of yeah. Taoism. And, and one thing I'll just say, and then you can tell me if maybe you wanna ask something else that might help your listeners is, um, I think people are getting caught up in being Taoists yeah. and forgetting Taoist being. And I'm interested in Taoist being, I'm just not interested in being a Taoist. I mean, I'm happy to help people think about it, like you said, these ways to affiliation or models of practice and attainment. I mean, there are many kinds of interpretive frameworks that I try to develop to help people think like more broadly about what Taoism is and how one could participate in the tradition um, in whatever way they have affinity with. But this aspect of, you know, how do you have a deeper root in the tradition, I think is quite challenging in the modern world. Yeah, I agree. I I was uh, reading a discussion between two people in an online forum a couple of weeks ago. And uh, well, <laughs> that was your first mistake. Yeah, it was my first mistake. And I, I, I didn't I didn't uh, chime in, thank goodness. But one of the they were they were talking about how one of the, one of the people was saying that, you know, you don't really need a teacher to learn all this stuff. You don't need a teacher to learn Nadan or any of this stuff. You know, you can learn it on your own. And that's Taoism is a bunch of gatekeepers and so on and so forth. And the other person said, yeah, I, I really wanted to learn Nadan, but um, I can't find a teacher in my state. And I was thinking, wow, if that's the biggest challenge that you have, you know, you're right. really fortunate. But I, you know, I, I didn't say anything. But, you know, given that, you know, it can be hard to find a good teacher or know what a good teacher is. Do you think it's possible for a person to have a, a practice just based on, say, following like, uh, Taoist ethics and, and and reading things like the Tao Te Ching and Zhuangzi uh, is is that a would you say that's a more viable way to go for someone that's not sure about whether to pr proceed with a teacher? Yes, although it goes back to that that principle of Gui Gun of returning to the roots. I mean, you need a reliable translation, and most of the translations aren't reliable. Right. So you know, and that's a kind of I don't know. We can get into that if we want, but so yes, I think there's a few things. I mean, one is it's it's like there are certain practices that I think are quite problematic and in fact dangerous to do on your own like Nadan. Yeah. And you know I understand the gatekeeper kind of critique. I think it's a you know it comes from a lot of different perspectives. So if it's if it's an authentic kind of concern, I understand it. If it's a way to avoid you know kind of like having some kind of spiritual humility, which it oftentimes is, um, and also not understanding the tradition. You know, like traditionally you study Nadan under a teacher for a variety of reasons. And it's not just the gatekeeper thing. It's because you can end up with a lot of issues. And so you need a reliable teacher, but you need a teacher that has a depth of understanding and practice where if something comes up, they say, that's normal. This is how you deal with it. Or, okay, this is an issue. Stop doing the practice or whatever it happens to be. So yes, I think setting aside that, because there's a lot of this now, like talismanic magic, you know, all these, you know, esoteric things where it's like, if you start doing this without kind of clear guidance, especially for, even under someone who has learned it, if they don't have a deep understanding of it, it can end up causing all kinds of problems. But if you set that aside, because I do think we can set it aside and say like, is it possible to develop a kind of foundational Taoist view? Yes. On your own? Yes. 
You know, you need the right materials, but you can. Is it possible to develop like a kind of foundational Dallas practice? Yes, you know, you just need the right materials. So, you know, I think a lot of this is possible, but you have to kind of know how to kind of find the materials and ideally find someone who's trustworthy to recommend things. And then also be able to kind of help. Like I just was talking to somebody and they're asking me about a translation. And I said, yeah, you know, that translator is a good translator and reliable. Um, but then they started talking about the translation and I was saying, yes, well, that's a problematic translation, but I'd have to look at it more carefully because it might be a contextual translation of a term that I say, you know, don't read it the way that's not reading it the way Dallas would ordinarily read it. They're reading it in a very particular context. So it's like all of these kinds of things that can end up with a lot of confusion. So this is why, you know, the way I look at these things is a lot more in terms of the foundational. What are the foundational pieces? And if you get those foundational pieces, then one, you have your own resources and your own kind of, you know, ground. And then also you have an ability to kind of discern, you know, and this is a part of the subtext of the Taoist tradition book and definitely more of my work now is to say to people like, you have to figure out what your affinities and your aspirations are. And your affinities and your aspirations might not align with certain teachers. So they might be a trustworthy teacher, but you just don't want to study what they're teaching or you don't have an affinity with the particular kinds of practices that they emphasize. Um, so all of that is a process. But I think what you're talking about is really, you know, there's a phrase in internal alchemy, Juji, establishing the foundations. So how do you establish the foundations? How do you have like firm grounding of your practice or your life? How do you actually kind of create foundations on that ground? And then you start to build something that's stable, that's something reliable, right? Whereas like some of the other things we're talking about is like really like, you know, building something in the sand or, you know, it's not a stable foundation. And so the whole thing's gonna topple over at some point, you know, which isn't necessarily bad. You know, this is the thing with being a Taoist, you know, you just don't know. So there, there's a number of people that I've met who went through like a pretty catastrophic falling out with the teacher community, but it woke them up yeah. and they were like, oh, now it's very clear to me what I have to be careful about, what I don't want to do, the kinds of things I do want to cultivate. So those are difficult lessons, you know, and I think a lot of us have them in our lives, go through difficulty and we gain certain kinds of insights about something and we're like, did I really have to go through it this way? Like, well, I mean, you did. So yeah. at least you did, you made it through. Now you have another opportunity. So what are you going to do with that opportunity? And the thing that, you know, I think upsets me and um, depresses me sometimes is it just doesn't have to be this way, right? So you don't have to actually do this to people, you know, where they come out wounded and then some of them, you know, basically abandon the path and they, 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 they view Taoism through the filter of a deficient teacher or a deficient community. And it's like, you have to decouple, I mean, we're all human beings. So right. you have to decouple the deficiencies or in this case, their extreme deficiencies. So that's a little bit harder to do, but, decouple the teacher from the teachings and decouple the teachings from the tradition. And then if you're lucky, maybe all of those things are aligned, you know, but that's going to be rare. It's going to be rare to have, I think, a teacher whose teachings are aligned and then whose those teachings are aligned with the tradition. And so there's a kind of ease of trustworthiness through the whole thing. Yeah. And, and, you know, what you talked about with like the issues with the teacher, um, uh, that's a common occurrence in the martial arts world as well. I think almost everyone has had that experience where they've, you know, gone into something with a lot of zeal and, and, you know, found out it wasn't quite what they thought it was, or there was some issue and, you know, they had to start all over again. Like you said, some people don't start all over again. They, they just go away, which is unfortunate, but I mean, it can be a valuable learning experience for sure. Or, or you, you know, you have a certain condition and you go to an acupuncturist or a, you know, a doctor of Chinese medicine and they can't treat that. Right. And it's like, well, okay, so that, that's just your condition and their particular facility with the medicine. Then you find a different one and they do. And then it's like, oh, okay. But if you just say, well, there was this one acupuncturist and they couldn't do it and they didn't help me. So therefore Chinese medicine doesn't work. It's like, 
there are a lot more physicians in the world, you know, and maybe maybe they're good at treating certain conditions and not other conditions and so on. So I think all of these analogies work. Yeah, martial arts training, um, uh, yeah, like medical uh, intervention or medical treatments. There are many things we can draw on to think about um, how to allow ourselves to relax through, you know, some of the attachments or some of the reactions. And especially, and this is the key thing for me, trying to help people is not not becoming dissuaded or discouraged by the failures of one or more people, you know, and then to kind of lose your own path. So maybe people don't aren't actually interested in following a Taoist path. They're more interested in that charismatic teacher. But right. for people who really are interested in following the path, that's my concern. My concern is like, don't lose your connection, even if you had to go through difficulty with a given individual. I agree. You know, you mentioned translations and um, this is another issue that comes up from time to time is that, you know, people can't really be sure if what they're being told is accurate, if they can't read and translate yeah. the language for themselves, you know, which can be difficult to do, or at least require a lot of uh, yeah. you know, investment on a person's part. And I, I wanted to mention your book, Primer for Translating Taoist Literature, because this is a, this is a really good book. It's like the first book of its kind. Um, right. It's like, I don't think there's another book out there like this. And it's a, could you describe a little bit how this book is set up for people that might be a little bit further along in their studies that, that might be interested in this? Yeah. So what I was trying to do, because obviously, you know, one of the few people with like kind of formal academic training in Dallas studies, but with the particular intent to, to translate Dallas literature. I mean, that was really one of the primary reasons I went to graduate school. I just wanted to be able to read classical <laughs> Dallas literature in the original. Um, and so it's trying to help people. I mean, it, it, in some ways it assumes a kind of basic understanding of classical Chinese, but I worked with Johan Hausen and he said, well, maybe you could add some other things that would make it more accessible to people who might not have that. So I think it's still readable for people that don't have that ability, but the intent is really to try to help people kind of engage Taoist literature in a bilingual way, whether they're can, are working on being bilingual or not learn Taoist kind of technical terminology and I kind of qualify some of that say these are my translations these are the translations of Taoist technical terms that I think are the most accurate in terms of the literature that we're talking about but it's set up through lessons so I'm really trying to show people a full spectrum of Taoist literature some of which may be familiar to them some of which may not be but especially with an emphasis on things that I think are relevant to a larger audience that wants to engage Taoist literature in this traditional way. And I agree with you, you know, there are a lot of misconceptions, but also I think issues that people bring to me about like, well, I'm never going to learn classical Chinese. So can I be a Taoist? Like, yes, you know, but we need some people to be bilingual, you know, and we need some people that really are trying to be translators. And I think about myself that way, in a larger sense. I don't just think of myself as a translator of Taoist literature. I think of myself as a translator of Taoism. So there's some indigenous, you know, Chinese religion called Taoism that's now going through this process of globalization. Right. And how do we translate these in multiple directions? And one thing that's been coming up more recently is if you're bilingual, how do you translate things back into Chinese. So people will say, oh, we should translate that term like this. It's like, well, actually, if you are thinking through it through a classical Chinese lens, if you if you translate that way, what you think it is, is that term. It's like, oh, right, we can't do that. So you have to start thinking in both directions. But I think for your listeners and in terms of how you've described this to me is really giving people um, deeper access into a selection of materials that will allow them also to start thinking through things a little more bilingually, even if they say, I don't know, it's all Chinese to me. And I always joke, fortunately, I know Chinese. So that's fine. That's all Chinese. Right. But but to also then say this is the kind of returning to the root thing of, well, now you have you're, you're already engaging in that process. So you've got the kind of Chinese source text. Then you have this translation and then you have someone that's willing to say, I'm not just translating for you. I'm willing to give you the vocabulary. I'm willing to talk to you about what are the translation issues that come up with this particular text or with this particular passage. So it's really trying to kind of encourage people to just start that process of inquiry of thinking about 
engaging Taoism in the West. So this would not be true for the most part for somebody like Zhou Shenyun, who was born in China and trained in China. And, you know, he's got different translation issues, right? But these translation issues are unique for people that are not birthright Chinese Taoists. And maybe even if you are, because can you read and translate classical Chinese Taoist literature? Maybe not. But for most people, engaging Taoism is a translational act. And this goes right back to what we're talking about with the philosophical Taoism. That was a mistranslation of Taoism that happened in the late 19th, early 20th centuries. And this is why we're where we are. Um, so what do we do when we say we need new translations? Well, this is also the new translation, the new translation of Taoism as are we really going to be kind of respectful towards the indigenous tradition? And then at the same time say, but we don't live in mainland China. So, um, and most of us, I think, I don't know what your audience is, but most of us aren't born ethnically Han. So then there's a whole nother set of issues in terms of Taoism. So then there's like demographic questions, but in terms of what we're talking about, it's really that translational act of, well, are we connected? to that kind of source. And I talk about this a lot, like now I'm much more, I think on the, whatever you want to call it, global Taoism side or Western Taoism in the actual sense, like tradition based Western Taoism or American Taoism, but that there still is Chinese Taoism as the source tradition. So that doesn't mean we just have to accept it. It's just like reading a text. We don't have to suck everything that's in a text, but can we engage it on its own terms? and then have our interpretations or then have our criticism or commentary or whatever it is we want to do. Yeah, absolutely. Could you, could you talk about a little bit about your foundation, what, what you do there? Uh, yeah, well, we're doing a lot now. So I, I think um, we're in the process of establishing this retreat center in West Paulette, Vermont. Um, so we're going to have like a physical center now where people can come on physical retreats. Uh, but for the most part, what we've been doing is um, doing remote teachings. Uh, so we do like what we refer to as Lundao, um, discussing the Tao or discourses on the Tao that are more like public talks that are open. Uh, we do scripture study. So now we're uh, almost done with the Neya and we're training, which is handbook number one, but we're using the handbooks for Taoist practice, kind of going through that systematically. Uh, we do spiritual direction with people. So just what I was saying to you about you don't have to be part of the Dallas Foundation. If you have an affinity with Taoism, like, do you need help? Um, and there's all spectrum of possibilities that way. But really, the intent is to try to help people understand, I think, Taoist practice realization from a tradition based perspective. And, you know, people are oftentimes surprised because I always qualify things, but I have to because with my, you know, scholarly background, I know that I'm located in Taoism in a very particular way, and some people aren't. And it, this isn't the truth, right? That's not what this is. This is, goes back to the first part of the conversation about, yes, there's the Taoist tradition, but there's this spectrum of possibilities, and there's this diversity. And so you can be a Taoist in many different ways. And so I just try to be very clear, and I think Kate's the same way, of in the context of doing this kind of work, saying this is what we're doing this is why we're doing it this way and you may or may not have an affinity with it you know so a lot of it is really trying to have a kind of tradition-based presence in america but and you know i say this explicitly that's basically not sinocentric or orientalist and that's the majority of what's going on so the sinocentric piece is like Real Taoism is in mainland China. Real Taoism is in mainland China. So you got to go to mainland China and get your $5,000 ready and buy ordination. Oh, sorry, um, I wasn't supposed to say that. So whatever, right? Like, and then it's like, well, then where are the real Taoists? They're either in mainland China or they're coming from mainland China to the United States. It's like, that's not global Taoism and that's not the case. There are many different actually ordained Taoists from many different backgrounds in many different geographical locations. And it's actually not true historically either. There's a little, a little bit of that in the Taoist tradition book about patterns of conversion to Taoism. Yeah. A lot of non-Han peoples converted to Taoism at different points in Chinese history. So there's a precedent for what's going on, but also not Orientalist. So rejecting or abandoning a lot of what we talked about as these kinds of received 
constructions of Taoism that have no connection to the actual tradition. But, and this is, I think, more of what you and I talked about in, uh, informally, is the emergence of something that we can call global Taoism. And that what I mean by that is that's still rooted in Chinese Taoism as its source tradition, but that's engaging the question of how do we adapt it to different cultural contexts. So an example that I oftentimes use with people that, you know, hopefully will come to fruition here, we call it the Stone Valley of Bo, the, the, this emerging retreat center um, in Vermont, is I'm not interested in building a Chinese temple in America. I have no interest whatsoever in this. That's crazy, unless you, that's your background. But why would you, and of course, this is, there's a lot of examples of this in terms of like indigenous ethnocultural groups coming to the United States and wanting that. So that makes sense. But what I'm more interested in is there's a kind of traditional Taoist spatiality. There's a tr 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 like traditional Taoist ar architecture. So how do we adapt that? to a certain kind of bioregion and go like here, there's a slate quarry nearby. So right. it's like, how do we use slate to build? Or what are the particular trees that are around here that we can use to build? And all these kinds of questions that are more difficult, right? It's way easier to just go, oh yeah, just build this, here's the template. It's like, but then you're just living in a kind of foreign landscape inside of a different cultural context in different geographical location. So that's what I mean by globalization. It's doing the difficult work of reflection and exploration and inquiry, and I think dialogue, right? So this is part of that too. Like, well, okay, how are we gonna do it? I don't know. This is what I'm thinking. What do you think? Well, I've lived in Vermont for my whole life, so this is what you should build with. Good to know. You know like that is, yeah, I mean, like some guy just showed up to Vermont and is like, I have an idea, let's use this. It's like, yeah, there's not much of that wood around here. Oh. What kind of wood should we use? Yeah. So, so again, having people think about all these questions, it's the same thing like with diet. You know, how do you think through traditional Chinese dietetics, traditional Taoist dietetics, and then say, oh, right, but I'm from a different ethnocultural background. I'm in a different bioregion. And then you can start to think through it and you can adapt to that. You know? yeah. I love that somebody's thinking that way because I think that when people like you talked about, you know, building like a traditional temple and things like that, nothing wrong with that. Beautiful. Right. Well, but I mean, it's a it's kind of a fantasy that the people right. want to live in. And then, of course, you have all these ethical uh, issues and environmental issues that come right. up from where you're getting your materials from and so on and so forth. Um, yeah. So, so for me, it really is. Uh, <clears throat> it's a question of bioregional ethics. It's a question of ecological sensibility. So, again, then you're like. Is that Taoist? It is now. Yeah, you know, yeah. maybe it used to be. I have some. I have some, like materials that I think are kind of like a pre-modern Taoist kind of quasi-ecological view. But yeah, I mean, it's modern. But it's it might be an important modification of how do we do this in our own specific regions inside of our own community. So it's just like you said, maybe in a particular context that's appropriate, but the majority of people, it's completely foreign, right? So this is what I mean. It's like some part of that, <clears throat> and I'm not, I agree, There's I've been to a lot of um, kind of traditional temples in America from a whole spectrum of traditions. And so I, <clears throat> excuse me, I appreciate the traditional aesthetics and in a certain way, the spirit of it, but then who's inhabiting it? And is that actually something that is they have an affinity with or it resonates with them? Or is there a way to do it where it actually makes them have a deeper affinity with it because it's an adaptation that's still rooted in that, but in a different form? You know, so I don't have an easy answer to this. I just part of the reason I'm saying this is to me, that's the side I'm on now. I'm on the side of, you know, intentionally trying to help whomever it is, including our community like basically be part of this emerging global Taoism that I also think is also local Taoism. So how are we Taoists in our local context or our regional contexts? Yeah, I agree. And, you know, we, we know, I guess, where we, we hope this is going, but what, what do you see as like emerging trends or where do you think that Taoism is particularly in the West and the United States is, is headed? Um, it's, Difficult to predict. Um, I think in my um, better moments, I see that there are more people that are interested in exploring tradition-based Taoism in an open way. 
And part of this is what I, you know, I've said, it's like, there's a lot of unlearning involved, including by self identified Taoists, which can be very difficult, you know? And then it's like, then they get upset with me because it sounds like I'm being arrogant. And it's like, but I'm giving you the materials I'm talking about. So then you tell me why you think that, right? Um, and so there's a lot of influences. So I think in my better moments, I see there is a kind of emerging kind of global Taoism, like across the board, where people really do have an affinity, they have that kind of interest in having a root in the tradition. And I don't mean that in a rigid sense, but just in the sense of like, if you claim to be a Taoist, you're invoking the tradition. Right. And if you invoke the tradition, there's a whole set of things that come with that. So I see that and that's true, but I think it's a very small minority of people. And of course, I mean, it makes sense. I mean, Taoism is late on the scene. There's a lot of, I mean, it's basically like um, uh, super saturation of like spirituality um, in the West and what I know the best in America. So how are people going to find it? It's difficult. Um, and then I think the other part in my, uh, other moments, I feel like Taoism is endangered in the modern world. And I don't even think that's the America. I think that's in the Chinese cultural sphere in East Asia, because the kind of Taoism that speaks to me and the deeper part of the tradition that I think is um, always been like a counterculture or always been almost like a resistance movement is this show the end tradition. So cultivation and refinement. And our teacher, Chen Yuming, you know, who's part of the Huashan lineage, um, you know, talked about in this book, Dream Trippers, um, he used to say this all the time when we talk about mainland Chinese monasticism, you know, that inside of any given monastery or temple, there are very few Sholian Taoists. And, you know, I think I shouldn't speak for him, but I think our kind of collective reading of it is that's always been the case. Yeah. It's always been the case that people that really not just rhetorically are interested in show Tao, cultivating the Tao, but actually are like, I'm giving my life to cultivating yeah. the Tao. And I'm willing to kind of see it through to the end, no matter what, even if I oftentimes think about this in terms of a mountaineering expedition, like everybody else is turning back. It's like, yeah, it's like, are you turning back? No, it's going to be a lot harder without your expedition party. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm not saying it has to be that I part of the, the, you know, the hope and the dream for the retreat center is to say, we don't want to do this alone. We want and we, we aren't alone. We have a community, but to kind of say to other people, like we can do this together. We don't have to all be isolated as individuals or separate Taoist communities or so on. So of course that takes some kind of degree of openness towards each other. But I think there's a part of this, the reason I'm saying that in response to your question, is I think, unfortunately, Taoism is getting co-opted and distorted and diluted in all kinds of ways that I'm not sure. I mean, I know it will survive. Um, one of the things, it was really funny, I had this conversation with uh, Chen Yuming, I think it's in the Dream Trippers book. Um, I think it's recorded in there, but I don't remember. Um, but I, he was telling me about, he was leaving the Chenzhen Complete Perfection Monastic Order, and I was really disappointed and discouraged by this because part of the reason I was in China was to basically live at the monastery with him. And he's like, I'm becoming a recluse. It's like, are you going to go back? No, it's totally corrupt. I'm not going back. And I remember, you know, kind of being younger. This was uh, 2006. I remember just kind of being shocked at this and then saying, oh, you know, maybe Taoism will die. And he looked at me, he started laughing. He said, Taoism may die, but the Tao will last forever. And I think that is the fundamental Taoist view that the Tao is there no matter what, and people can always connect with it. And not only that, the kind of deeper practice can emerge at any moment. And it only takes a few people to keep that going. And this is part of my, you know, one of the reasons I'm critiquing the, the construction of philosophical Taoism, because I think what it systematically does is it ignores that there was a group of loosely affiliated master disciple communities that set the foundation for the tradition or that said, this is what it is. It's individuals cultivating the Tao and it's small groups of people cultivating the Tao and it will survive no matter what. Then the dominant, what happens in the dominant culture, the dominant society is an open question. So I have no doubt about that. It's just more of, um, for me, there's an aspect of Taoism that I oftentimes will say, 
it's a system of transformation. So you can also think of it, if you don't like that language, you can say it's a system of returning to what we fundamentally are. I don't really care about that languaging part. But the reason I say it's a system of transformation is it awakens these parts of ourselves that are either dormant or they've been forgotten or there are all these factors trying to distort that. And Taoism is ringing that bell, holding that space to say, come back to this possibility connect with this reality that you're part of. And that is being distorted. And that is being distorted by a lot of self-proclaimed and self-identified Taoists. And so now there's a bigger problem because that means then, you know, like you said, who do you trust? Um, you know, who's gonna provide you like accurate guidance, but what's going to happen? You know, if, if the majority of things that are going on and obviously spiritual capitalism is one of the epidemics you know, if everybody is commodifying Taoism and everybody is kind of presenting Taoism as a product, and this is obviously true in some of the other things we talked about, then where are people going to find something? And I don't mean it like the way it sometimes sounds like, oh, this is like pure Taoism. I mean it as the part of the tradition that's really giving human beings something different. And that's opening up a possibility to them that they can step into, right? And that reveals this kind of numinous landscape that we're part of and that's that kind of cosmological embeddedness and relationality that really is Taoism. well luckily we have some good teachers out there and it's just a question of finding them i think but i, I think you're right that there's there's always going to be people around small groups of people who are dedicated to this because you know they, they do it for the right reasons yeah it's the same in, in any uh, undertaking, whether it's like Taoism or martial arts or anything that's truly worth doing. There's, yeah. there's always going to be a few. Um, would you like to tell people where they can find you at so they can find out more about your writings and your project? Um, yeah, they can just go to the Dallas Foundation website. Yeah. yeah, we'll put links to that in the description. Dr. Kamiathi, it's truly a pleasure speaking with you today. I hope we can do it again sometime. Can you stick yes, around? It, it was great. Thanks. And I hope it was helpful for you and for your listeners. Very much so. I appreciate it.